Hey everyone, in our latest Trade to Black podcast, big news from Washington last week involving the DEA, how they're no longer going to ban five key psychedelic compounds, which could pave the way for legalization of psilocybin within the next 24 months. So why the change in heart amongst government officials? It could be because of one person, Michael Pollan. He is the star of the new Netflix documentary called How to Change Your Mind, which spotlights the psychedelic industry and the impact that this film is having on society related to mental health is huge. So what kind of influence is this having amongst government officials as well? We break it all down right now in our latest podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's Trade to Black podcast. As usual, I am your host, Shad Dales. Thanks for checking in. And as usual, Feel free to leave a comment below because this week we're going to talk about this whole emerging psychedelic space and the attention that it's received from this Netflix documentary, How to Change Your Mind. It's been trending top five over the last couple of weeks, and suddenly we're getting a lot of attention pertaining to this industry again. So where do you think this will go? Leave a comment below as usual. If you like the content we're producing, subscribe to our channel and click on that bell for all notifications. So there's some big announcements and a big documentary that's been going on, uh, as I said, and I want to bring in our guests. But before we get into that, as usual, all views on the Trade of Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are purely opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or our guests as investment advice. The views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice. So let's welcome in, love the way he always looks. Look at those shades. He's an award-winning filmmaker, entrepreneur, and psychedelic advocate who needs no introduction at all. Zappy Zaplin joins us once again. How is the summer going? Oh, amazing. Great to be back. I'm sitting at the Mind Army headquarters. And yes, that logo is painted on the wall. So we're not going anywhere. We are about to get psychedelics legalized. And what you're talking about right now is really the moment that we've needed, kind of the shoe to fall, yes. and now we're in action. Okay, let's tee things up. Before I get into, the, obviously, the news this week, for people that are learning for the first time, and I know we've discussed in the past, Mind Army, what's the main initiative so people understand what it is? Sure, the Mind Army is fighting for the right to pursue happiness, and we believe it's everybody's inalienable right to go inside their own mind for answers and healing. And we're not going to sit here in 2022 and have people tell us that alcohol is good, tobacco is good, but somehow, you know, psilocybin, it, mushrooms are off the table, even if you're in crisis. We just don't accept that. The science is super strong. And as you alluded to, Michael Pollan's new special, How to yeah. Change Your Mind, top five on Netflix. That means tens of millions of people are watching that. And it's really changing minds. I've had conversations this week with 80 year olds and teenagers and people that don't know anything about psychedelics who said, I just saw that show. I realized the opportunity that we all have and wow, how do I enter this either for myself or as an investor, they're really realizing that this is the moment that my phone's ringing off the hook. I, all these people really? coming out of the woodwork to <clears throat> be in the psychedelic space or to have an experience now that Michael Pollan used science, uh, entertainment and you know they say the medium is the message so to put that on on Netflix and have it be at the top means that you know mental health is now being taken seriously psychedelic medicine is the number one agenda in battling the mental health crisis yes Yes. Uh, as I mentioned off the top, you're an award-winning filmmaker. You've worked closely with the documentary pertaining to Lamar Odom. So circling back to the actual How to Change Your Mind uh, Netflix documentary, did you see it? And if so, did you think it was good? Yeah, I thought it was exceptional. Uh, the It was shot beautifully, but the science was really deep. And what I love is Michael Pollan, you know, he wrote this How to Change Your Mind. It was a best-selling book. But when he wrote that, he was 60 years old. He'd never tried psychedelics before. So when he tried it in his 60s and he had this epiphany that, oh, my God, like this is about health and mental health, he was compelled to write that book and now to do the Netflix special. So I think, you know, somebody like him who represents the baby boomer audience, the people who aren't, you know, psychedelic advocates already, but just regular people, uh, it was powerful. And then for him to try the different medicines and share his personal experience, plus all the science, it, it's a killer. I mean, it just put this 
uh, psychedelics on the map. And to your point, we've seen some political breakthroughs in the last week. We've seen some uh, incredible pushback on the DEA. And so you can see that this thing's actually having an effect. It's emboldening the politicians, the lawmakers. The, oh, so you the, think the that public. some some of the stuff that was made in Washington this you this week, you think that this documentary had that kind of impact on their decision. You agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. I can wow. see it in just how emboldened they are and how quickly they're acting. We've never seen anything like this. And I, I'm going to make a point. One of the things that happened was that the DEA was scheduled. They had said that they were going to put five more DMT molecules on schedule one. Schedule one means it has no medical benefit and it's highly probable for addiction. They yeah. wanted to put these five compounds, which are not addictive and do have medical benefit on there. And so they got some pushback and then they said, okay, we're going to schedule a hearing to hear about this from the public and medical right. people and so forth. And then boom, Michael Pollan's uh, show drops. And then all of a sudden they start getting pressure all over the place. And they said, okay, hold on time out. The DEA said, we are not going to deschedule, reschedule these right now. What we're going to yep. do is we're going to push this to health and human services. And we're going to take their recommendation about how to do it. And believe me, Shad, never in history has the DEA has happened? relented like that. And, it, and, I have a feeling why, that why, why do you why do you think they did because the overwhelming support and the data that's being produced? Yeah, I think so, and I think the social pressure, which is everything right now, you know, they knew that if they were the ones sitting there saying, "Okay, we're making these things that could help with mental health, we're making these yeah. illegal right now," that they were going to get blowback from their colleagues, from the medical people, maybe from the president, and they just said, "Whoa, like we're not going to yeah. be in the middle of this yeah. firestorm." Let's push it to the people who can make the decision. And, you know, that is an incredible turn of events. I think it's going to set a precedent for other psychedelics like psilocybin, LSD, MD, you know, other ones, because they, they mentioned these, but I think this will be the precedent for all of the other ones being looked at and then rescheduled or reclassified. So educate me then moving forward, descheduled or reclassified. Um, where where does I get like everybody's talking about how MDMA is going to be legalized, you know, within the U.S. probably at some point in 2023. Psilocybin is probably not far behind that, to say the least. Um, do you see this being legalized within the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah. So here here's the exciting part you, is that. You do. Wow. Yeah, I, I absolutely do, because things are accelerating, given that the mental health crisis is so bad. Uh, so what happened is in uh, in more news that broke this week, uh, the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, um, yeah. they came out with an announcement. They they wrote a letter back to one of the senators basically saying that they agreed with this person that we need to have a task force to put in place whatever regulations and protocols are going to be in place for <clears throat> the legalization of MDMA and psilocybin within the next 24 months. And when I yep. saw that and everybody saw they were like, oh my God, like these guys have never set a date. You know, usually like the, the senator that had proposed it said, we anticipate this being available in the next 24 months. Usually they would respond back with, we're taking whatever action we wanna take and you know, in due course, we'll do it. No, they, they stated back the 24 months. And I think that they referenced that mental health was the reason that this needed to be expedited and we need to do it. But like to see them put in a letter, psilocybin mushrooms next 24 months, yeah, just I to know. parrot that back is just absolutely incredible. Never happened before. I think they probably watched the Michael Pollan, all their, you know, at the water cooler, they're hearing about it and they go, hey, we don't want to be the guys who said no to potentially saving, you know, millions from suicide and addiction. We just can't be the, we don't want to be those guys. Maybe, you know, it looks yeah. like the science supports this. So I watched really, I, excited. I watched the first episode pertaining to LSD. It really grabbed my attention. And then I just started watching last night, the uh, psilocybin chapter two, part two. And what really grabbed my attention was over, I think it was Switzerland was the country, but they have this institution called exit, which is basically like, um, I guess, uh, assisted, you know, suicide. And, yes. Yeah. And I was like, 
one of the guys they were interviewing was, you know, considering this, having constant conversations, was ready to make a commitment. And then he was introduced to psilocybin and his whole fear of death and expectations uh, changed everything. And the way it was kind of described is that you, you, you have something happen to you in life and your brain, brain is then wired in a certain way. And it's like um, I had Peyton Nyquist from Numinous on a couple of weeks ago, and it's almost like these grooves as if you're tobogganing down a hill and you keep going down those same grooves. And what, basically what these compounds are doing is getting you outside of those grooves and actually looking at things from a different light. And we did a great piece last week on uh, Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park. Yes. And about how he had this uh, rumination where it was just like the same thoughts over and over and over all the time. And it really blew me away to have a true understanding as some of the things that I'm hearing from different executives I'm speaking to on my podcast. And then in addition, watching this Netflix documentary. And now I'm starting to see even myself who follows this closely, how exactly this works and how promising it is. And everything that people are worried about going into it's like everybody talks about that same thing and understands and relates, but then the outcome is just, I can't speak on that because I've never done that before, but the outcome is, as you said, uh, Zappy, it, it changes your life. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, so powerful when you watch the Michael Pollan special or, you know, when you look at that and you see somebody like you were talking about, there was somebody with cluster headaches that were so bad that they were near suicide at all points. And who can blame them, you know, to have a splitting headache constantly for years and it's just debilitating. And then they do the psilocybin mushrooms and all of a sudden they're having pain-free days. And it speaks to the neuroplasticity that all these psychedelics have because there's, you know, they all have different opportunities for healing, but all of them seem to create some kind of neuroplasticity, like you're saying, create new trails for your thoughts and new patterns and get out of those old ones, which may have been inherited, may have been trauma-based. And if we have this opportunity to take people out of that, we have to do it. And so just coming back to my mind army, uh, we're fighting for the descheduling of Ibogaine because Ibogaine is an addiction interrupter. And the the mind army is declaring war on fentanyl. We know that you can't keep people from getting addicted, but once they are, we have Ibogaine that can break their addiction let's make this available and you know unfortunately to this point it's been on schedule one but according to rick doblin founder of maps he said that it never should have been on schedule one it's been proven non-addictive and the mind army is dedicated to getting that d schedule right now so we can address this fentanyl crisis in a real way not just educating people because nobody gets addicted to fentanyl uh you know, accidentally, they really, you know, or or rather, I should say, they're not trying to get addicted. They have to take pain pills, and then they run out of those, then they go try to find some on the street, and they eventually wind up having to take fentanyl. We can't stop that. There's hundreds of thousands of people right now that are that that's happening for. But if we can disrupt it with Ibogaine, like, what are we doing? We've got to do this now. And I think that's what these senators are responding to. And, you know, you brought up the point about this end of life. Uh, Two senators this week came out and they modified the Right to Try Act, which Donald Trump had passed, which says if you're terminally ill and you failed uh, another protocol for for that, that you have the right to try experimental things that have gone through at least Schedule 1, which, you know, in this case would make psilocybin available. And so the... Uh, these two senators, you know, again, emboldened by what's happening in this moment of science and reality of tens of millions of people thinking differently, they said, we want psychedelics in the right to try. So if somebody is terminally ill, they deserve the right to have that yeah. closure, have that beautiful ending with psilocybin or something else that's going to work for them. Wow. I've tried to get Rick Dobbin on a number of times, busy guy to say the least, but when you have conversations with him and he is the face of this whole industry, uh, what's his overall, um, uh, I guess, mindset with where this industry is right now? And, and, and what's he think about how it's growing? And like, is there things that he's really excited about? Like, what are, like what's his overall sentiment when it comes to the direction of where the industry's uh, progressing? Yeah, he's really excited because he sees real science happening, real companies going through trials and the different, you know, uh, 
all the all the clinical research that's taking place. But Rick, Rick said to me, you know, when they get MDMA going and it's available for patients, MAPS is going to switch their focus now to ibogaine, and that's exciting because you know the conversation that I you know just had with you about ibogaine being the addiction interrupter. Rick's like, that's the the second biggest problem we have is addiction here next to mental health. So they're going to attack it. Um, you know, I was talking to him. I've been talking to him about a company that we've spoken about that I'm uh, the chief visionary officer for, uh, Psychoceutical, which is the best of psychedelics meets the best of farm of pharma of pharmaceuticals. And what we're talking about is delivery systems that work in pharma that we're bringing over to the psychedelic industry. And one of the first ones that we're doing is our nano ibogaine. And the reason for that, and the reason Rick's behind it fully is that we're talking about what, you know, ibogaine, when you give it to somebody, it breaks an addiction, but it can be uh, cardiotoxic. So you want to give as little as possible. So psychoceuticals patents would allow you to give as little medicine as possible, target it, but the person gets as much bioavailability as they need. And then secondly, because the ibogaine plan is endangered, we have to conserve it. If we can give people nano amounts of ibogaine and get the same effect, then we are spreading that out so that millions of people can have it. So I see breakthroughs in the psychedelic space like psychoceutical, uh, like what Rick's doing. Uh, these are how we make all these things more like a pharma drug. And that way, the medical establishment is going to be comfortable to bring these things forward. And it's kind of shad. It's like Buckminster Fuller, the futurist, used to say, you don't, don't try to destroy a system that you don't like. Make a better system, and that will just replace the one that's not working right. And so we have mm -hmm. that opportunity here with psychedelics. We're going to show through clinical research. I was at a lab for psychoceutical this weekend in Baltimore, and it's a DEA Schedule One lab. And I'm watching them, you know, mix these things and work on them. And I'm like, wow, like this work is really happening, not just at, for psychoceutical in that lab, but other places, it's really happening. And thank goodness we need it so bad for mental health and addiction that if these things are available, like they say, MDMA next year, psilocybin within the next two years, we're, we're hoping to deschedule Ibogaine immediately and have that available. So that to have that in our tool belt will be transformational. And um, so you, yeah. you believe that um, outside of psilocybin and MDMA, like you taught, you, you made a point about mental health. And I was always under the understanding that addiction is mental health. And in some ways it is, but um, is it, is it like, you were mentioning about ibogaine potentially being a main contributor or compound solution for people with addiction. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Uh, ibogaine okay. is a, an African root that is known to be able to break a heroin, a meth addiction, uh, crack, you know, cigarettes, alcohol. And if it's done in the right set and setting with the medical staff and done the right way, it has a powerful effect to give you a window of, you know, maybe it's 90 days where you can change your lifestyle. You're not going to be craving drugs. You're not going to have that in your system. And if you can change your lifestyle, like Lamar did for the last couple of years, like a lot of people, you know, there's movies like Dosed and there's all kinds of, uh, you see the reality of truth. My first film, there's powerful information about Ibogaine disrupting the worst, uh, addictions possible. And so as I look at that, I say, we have the chance right now to, and I'm calling on the industry, I'm writing an industry letter to the psychedelic medicine industry saying, let's all collaborate and let's get ibogaine descheduled. We'll put a win up on the board for the psychedelic industry. And then, you know, I was really excited because Michael Pollan, after his special aired, he went on the Tonight Show, he was talking on there, and he referenced that he thought it would be five years before psychedelic compounds were available to the public and mass. I tweeted back that I thought it would be more like two years because of the mental health crisis. And then the, the, the letter comes out from the, 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 um, the regulators and boom, Michael Pollan, he retweeted my tweet about two years. And I took that as he was agreeing with me that it looks like the acceleration in part from what he's doing. Maybe the he doesn't understand and all. Yeah, 
maybe he doesn't understand the true impact of what his film actually could do. He's staying humble to say the least, but yes. um, that those are some valid points as to how this has brought a lot of attention once again, which is badly needed. And you know, I've said this in the last couple of weeks that, you know, quite honestly, when COVID first hit, there was a lot of government assistance for people making money that's now ended. And, you know, inflation at an all time high. And quite honestly, people are struggling massively right now, which is so many things. And not to mention you had this growing concern uh, spiraling out of control rapidly with mental health. Um, I think we've all known a person, myself included, uh, of somebody dear that's passed of suicide over the last couple of years, which is one of the leading cause of deaths now in like the world, which is kind of surreal to think about. But to your point, you're right. Like the government officials five years from now, as much as time flies, that's so much further away. I really do believe these things are going to develop. You see what happened up in Canada and BC mm-hmm. uh, earlier this summer with the announcement of decriminalizing all drugs. Yeah. Um, the Very Portuguese, smart. our Portugal, obviously model has seemed to be like a, a great example as to how things can change. But I bring all this together and like, look, this industry has been hit so hard from a business standpoint of the last eight months. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll call it like it is a lot of people that should not even have been involved in this industry, raising money and companies going public. It was so misled. So if I'm looking at this, not only as a consumer, but an investor as well, I believe that you're going to start to see an influx of companies start to come into the industry once again, but it's going to be smarter people, more qualified people with this background. Do you believe that? And if so, have you heard any sentiment or any conversations that leads to, uh, like can make people believe or led to believe that that will happen? Yeah, I, I believe that a hundred percent Shad. I mean, this is an incredible time and it feels very much like the beginning of the dot com when the dot-com bubble burst and everybody threw the baby out with the bathwater. They sank all the stocks and yes, it was way too frothy. And yes, there was all kinds of garbage. But what happened was the weak companies that weren't doing anything, they kind of faded away. But when I was looking at it at that time, I was like, well, I'm using email more than ever. I'm starting to shop online. Like I don't right. think this internet's going anywhere. I mean, yeah, there's some garbage, but what about Amazon? What about eBay? What about these good companies? And so I leaned into that and I feel like this is the same moment where it's like, yes, all the garbage, maybe a lot of people were in cannabis who decided to come in as psychedelics to try to make a buck. Some of the fast operators who just saw this very quick hit. But meanwhile, like I said, if I'm sitting at a DEA schedule one lab, watching them work on psychedelic compounds for psychoceutical, yeah. I'm seeing MDMA getting cleared. I'm seeing all this incredible research being done. These are the Amazons. These are the companies that will be left. And I say, and I've said this for a while, even if you bought at the high and you're down right now, some of these companies are going to be the pharmaceutical companies of the 1920s or the biotech companies of the 1990s. You can make your entire retirement off of owning just a few of these really good companies right now. Because if these companies have one drug that works, two drugs that work, in the mental health addiction space, uh, end of life, uh, pain relief. I mean, these are multi-billion dollar drugs and you want to pick the right company, but the timing could not be better to enter right now. I look at a company like a Thai Life Sciences that's trading under four bucks right now. Nine clinical trials they have going on right now with over $400 million in the pipeline for diversification. And like you said, if you land with one, you know, Prozac to end up being forget who bought it out, but it was a hundred and ten billion dollar market cap based on that one drug alone. Yeah, but that's a you know, great and example. Here's the, yes, but the promising thing in all this, outside of the money, because I know it's a delicate situation when it comes to this industry, it hits home to almost every single person. If you're not suffering from mental health, you either have a sibling or a spouse or a cousin or a close friend that's struggling. Everybody it can understand, relate to it during these times. And the promising thing about all this is that it's not just good. It's unbelievable the data that's being produced for people to improve their quality of life. 
and no better example. And like, uh, honestly, for all my viewers watching this, if you haven't gotten a chance yet, please go onto Netflix and watch this documentary, How to Change Your Mind. It'll really blow your mind on how these things potentially help you. Leave a comment below if you've seen it and what you think of it. But uh, that that's, you know, that to me is what really puts things into perspective on where this industry uh, is, is right now and where it's going to go because uh, it's overwhelming success yeah. and unbelievable data that's being produced, right? Yeah, you know, what's incredible is, you know, I have a company called KetaMD, it's an at-home ketamine treatment over telemed. The demand is absolutely through the roof to our website. And uh, you saw that New Life recently is a ketamine uh, company. They raised 23 million during the last couple months. Um, people are realizing that there is a serious mental health situation that needs to be addressed. It's a, you know, multi hundred billion dollar industry and the companies that have money right now to do the trial work and to, you know, get these things through the pipeline, like a regular pharma would do. Those are the ones that are going to thrive. And I heard that said by Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary at the Benzinga conference. When I saw you, he said, I would bet on the companies that have the money. And so you look at, you know, a tie, they have a couple hundred million plus in cash. You know, you see companies that are, have a balance sheet to, to, to execute their clinical research. Those companies are going to be winners. If somebody's sitting there and they have no capital, but they have a great idea, they may not be here. Somebody else may come along, like you said, smarter, quicker, more funding, and they may be that company. But if you have money, in this time and you have the passion for this your company will be one of those pharma companies like the 20s or the biotechs in the you know 90s these companies made a century of returns in a very short amount of time and that's what we're talking about for psychedelic medicine right now drug development is not cheap so don't be looking at companies in this space that are focusing on one trial with con con one compound and have raised a couple of million bucks. Like drug development is into the hundreds of millions of dollars. But I guess that's the point when we brought up diversification, people really understand obviously what the word meant, but applying to this industry, as we go along this road, people are getting a better, better idea what it actually means. And like you said, it takes time and with time it takes money, but listen, always looking sharp. It's great to obviously connect Thank with you. you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. But uh, this has been good. It's been great. I just wanted to have you on, obviously, just to see you because you're a filmmaker. And this has been an incredible documentary film that's been out. But I really wanted to see what your thoughts were, not only from a regulatory standpoint and the current state of the industry, but from a business aspect to where you see this going. But I think we can both concur and agree that, um, you know, as much as it's challenging times right now, this could be one of the industries that actually pulls out, you know, this quote unquote, you know, recession because of the badly uh, needed uh, state of mind as to like where the uh, society is at with mental health right now. And I know that seems kind of like lofty expectations, but biotech has been hit the hardest, yep. you know, out of any industry over the past 12 months. And it could be that same industry that carries people out of this, uh, a good you know, point, whole little quote yeah. unquote recession, and, right? And like you said, biotech's been crushed. So of course, psychedelic stocks that are even more speculative yeah. are down even more. But what people don't realize is there's real science taking place. There's incredible companies. And if you get in the right ones right now, while things are down, while things are shaking out, there's a lot of incredible IP that's being gobbled up by some of the folks that do have money to do the clinicals. Uh, this is a this is a great space. I mean, this is like no matter what happens, this bioscience for mental health and addiction will be funded. Number one and number two, it's counter cyclical. The worse things get, the more we need these compounds to save us, and the bigger deal they're going to be. So, unfortunately, this is you know a, a recession proof industry that looks like things are going to get substantially worse, yeah. and the industry is going to grow, you know, exponentially. Good point. Okay, let's keep in touch. All Sound right. good? Be well. Thanks. Peace, Chad. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, wait until you see what we have next. Some of the best thought leaders in the verticals that we cover, from cannabis and psychedelics to cryptos and NFTs and sports wagering. So if you want to learn more, make sure to click on that bell for all notifications. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.